Test balloons instead. Kim? Yes, sir, we can see that, sir. <coughs> Please carry on. The presentation, right? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, thank you. This is, uh, uh, this is a gentleman uh, whose image uh, is, uh, is not uh, very commonly presented during that meeting. Uh, but I think this is an image we must be exceedingly familiar with. Can, I think, can sir, I, this is daughter? This is Charles' daughter. That is right. right. This uh, is used to be called Crazy Daughter. And uh, if you can see why he was called Crazy Daughter, because you can see the crazed animated. Sir, uh, yeah. So some people were asking on Twitter when uh, whether you will be able to trust your patient with this guy or not. That's right. <laughs> Just looking at him. That's right. So uh, obviously, you know, uh, so you can see how crazed he looks. Right, right. Uh, and... Uh, What's, uh, what's curious is that this is actually a photograph that appeared in uh, Life and Time magazine in the 60s. And this is Charles' daughter doing uh, an angioplasty on his patient. Okay, this is while the angioplasty was uh, being performed. So an equivalent of this image in India would have been, let's say, uh, if, uh, if Dr. Bedi is doing an angioplasty and it, it is presented on the uh, cover story of uh, of India Today or Outlook or something like that. So that's how big this event was. But uh, what's also interesting to note is that the first angioplasty that Charles' daughter did was an accidental angioplasty. He was trying to do an uh, uh, angiography of the aorta and the iliac was blocked and he managed to pass a guide wire through this and he managed to dig in a catheter and he found that he's, he's crossed the lesion, the occluded iliac, and uh, that's how the first accidental angioplasty happened. Uh, this is the first intentional angioplasty that was ever done. If, can you see my uh, cursor here? Nikhil, can you see my yes, cursor? Yes, sir, yes, sir. So you can see that there's a there's practically a CTO or a very thread-like uh, lumen in the femoral artery, in the superficial femoral artery. And this was dilated progressively. So the method of angioplasty that Charles' daughter used was basically on a guide wire. He would cross the lesion. And then it was a serial progressive dilatation of the femoral artery. And uh, you can see that this is the the image post angioplasty, post dilatation, it wasn't really uh, called or christened angioplasty at this stage. It was just <coughs> called uh, dottering, actually, because he didn't know what to call it. He opened up the artery. He had not coined the term uh, dilatation. He had not coined the term angioplasty. So he just said, oh, yes. managed to open up the artery. And he started calling his procedure dottering. So he, this is a dottered artery. You can see this. And this is the patient. This is the first patient of an in intentional angioplasty. Her name is Laura Shaw. And uh, she's looking at the images of her own artery that have been opened up by Charles' daughter. Uh, this subsequently, uh, his procedure became quite famous. And, uh, but the surgeons, particularly the, the, you know, there used to be cardiac and vascular surgeons in those days. This was um, in Oregon. And uh, when they would refer patients to him for angiography, they would write very clearly, you know, as you can see here, visualize the artery, but don't try to fix it. Don't put your, you know, hands into it. Don't try and open it up. That's our job. So do not uh, ever try to open up the artery. Do an angiogram and come out. That was his reputation. Which brings us to an inter interesting question about uh, what is industrial design, particularly in reference to... Uh, some of the devices that we use. So it's, it's basically a practice of, of designing products, devices, objects, which are subsequently mass produced and, and therefore used by scores of people, hundreds of people, thousands of people, or perhaps millions of people. There's got to be a process to this design. And this design includes appearance, it includes uh, you know, functionality, and also includes uh, things like manufacturability. How do you mass produce uh, something like this. So how do you mass produce a device that can open up arteries? This is in squarely in the domain of industrial design. 
And uh, what's most interesting is that surgeons and physicians uh, who have been our predecessors, our, uh, our forefathers in that sense, have <laughs> I can hear some crosstalk. If you could just request the other mics to uh, be muted, Nikhil. Nikhil? Yes, sir. I can hear some crosstalk. Can you just uh, request? You can see that. The other people to please uh, you know, mute their mics. That's right, right. Done, done. Okay, done, sir. So, as I said, that you know, uh, we found that some of our uh, predecessors in our discipline have been invested in industrial design, particularly the devices and the objects that they used to open up arteries. Can you identify this man or this adolescent? Uh, no, sir, I can't actually. Okay. So, this uh, is a 14 year old or a 15 year old kid uh, called Thomas Fogarty. Okay, now we've all used the Fogarty catheter, and uh, this was the age at which he was uh, using or providing services in a hospital in Cincinnati. Okay, uh, because he had lost his father, and uh, they needed the family needed money to, to keep going, and therefore he decided to offer his services uh, in cleaning equipment in uh, operating rooms in a hospital in Cincinnati. And that's when he observed that many people who were doing um, surgeries, surgical procedures for acute thrombosis of uh, arteries, uh, were doing it uh, in the most curious manner, which was they would give multiple incisions, they would use all kinds of artery clamps and other things to pull out thrombus. Sometimes they would do longitudinal arteriotomies extending for centimeters together or inches together in multiple places, and then uh, would try and extract thrombus from these arteries. And most of these cases would end up very badly. Uh, there would be rethrombosis, there would be mortality, there would be extensive limb loss in these cases. And this was a 14, 15 year old uh, Thomas Fogarty who was cleaning equipments just outside of OTs. He requested some of the surgeons, particularly one vascular surgeon called John Cranley who indulged him and who said, you know, why don't you come in and take a look at us while we're operating. And uh, so that's what he did. And that's when he thought of uh, the design of a device that could actually be used in extracting thrombus, the, the Fogarty's uh, thrombus extraction catheter, the embolectomy catheter. And this is what he did. Now, this is a, he worked on the design for a few years. He would tie the end of a, a, a surgical glove to, the, to a catheter, uh, usually a urinary catheter. And, uh, but because there wasn't glue available in those days that could bond or fuse vinyl and plastic to each other. So he used to tie it up with the fishing flies because he was also an amateur, uh, you know, he was into fishing. And so he used these fishing um, flies or ties to actually attach the, the end, the cut finger of uh, a surgical glove onto a catheter with a hole. And that's what he used initially. And this is, these are images from the patent that finally uh, he submitted many years later, which became known as the Fogarty's balloon catheter. This is, these are real images from the patent he submitted to the US Patent Office. And what's also curious is that, uh, so all of this happened, I mean, these patents and these, the catheter really happened when he, so after his, after he passed out of school, he joined, uh, uh, the medical school in Cincinnati and uh, finished his MD. And before he finished his MD, he got, he got the patent, the first patent for the embolectomy catheter. But he couldn't find anyone to mass produce it. This is where industrial design comes in. He couldn't make this uh, a clean product which could be perfectly reproducible and usable in many cases. And he needed some sort of a manufacturer to do this for him and nobody was willing to come forward. So there was an electrical engineer uh, who had a small time company called Lowell Edwards, who uh, thereby collaborated with him. And this happened when he had passed his, his MD. He became an MD and he just enrolled himself into a surgical fellowship uh, now in Oregon. Uh, and uh, that's when they decided to go into a partnership, Lowell Edwards and Thomas Fogarty. And 
from that was born the company Edward Life Sciences. And to this date, all of us are using embolectomy catheters manufactured by Edward Life Sciences. And the reason I show you this photograph of Charles' daughter and the young Thomas Fogarty, so you saw him as a kid, as an adolescent. This is Thomas Fogarty while he was doing his surgical residency. And after just clearing his surgical residency, he joined as a, as a young uh, consultant at Oregon. And Thomas, uh, Thomas Fogarty and Charles' daughter were working in the same hospital. Can you believe that? Okay, at, at around the same time when the first angioplasty happened, uh, the embolectomy catheter had been invented. It had gone into mass production. Remember, this is a young surgical resident whose patent has been accepted and uh, the, uh, the catheter has gone into mass production. And around the same time, Charles' daughter is doing the first angioplasty. Now, the reason I show this to you is because they couldn't put two and two together. They couldn't meet because Fogarty was warned by his surgical seniors that there's this crazy chap in cardiology and radiology called Dotter. Stay away from him. You know, he's full of crazy ideas. You shouldn't go close to him. There was still this antagonism between surgeons and uh, interventionists. And, and therefore, even though they worked together in the same place, they never collaborated. So the, the first balloon angioplasty never happened in Oregon, though the first balloon catheter embolectomy catheter and the first angioplasty were done at the same institute by two different people. And this happened, uh, I'd say, coterminously or contemporaneously around roughly the same time because Fogarty was asked to stay away from Charles' daughter. And uh, what happened subsequently, because daughter found out that uh, uh, Thomas Fogarty uh, was, um, had invented something called as the Fogarty balloon uh, catheter, Daughter thought that, you know, we could perhaps use this catheter to open up arteries. So he thought of the, the process of a balloon angioplasty around the same time, never really met or was allowed to interact very freely or collaborate very freely with Thomas Fogarty. And obviously, uh, he used the embolectomy catheters in the iliac segment to try and open up vessels, but it never worked. And the reason it never worked was because of something we will be discussing subsequently, which is called compliance of the balloon. And this is why I'm introducing the concept of compliance because Fogarty's embolectomy catheters are extremely compliant. The material they're made up of can easily be pressed and suppressed, and therefore they cannot be used to open up arteries. So this is to suggest that uh, both these people worked uh, exactly at the same time in the same institute where the first angioplasty happened and uh, and where the first balloon catheter was invented, but they never collaborated together. So the first balloon angioplasty actually was a, on account of um, the, this man. Do you see the, the young, handsome, mustachioed fellow in the middle in the white coat? Uh, this person is Andreas Grunzik, okay? And uh, uh, this is someone called Philip Meyer, okay? This is an image from Zurich, okay? Now, uh, Andreas Grunzik, uh, can anybody guess how old he was when he performed the first successful balloon angioplasty? Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. I think uh, Nikhil, sir, is not there. Oh, he's not there. Okay. Yeah. So just to uh, be clear, yeah. uh, I mean, if anybody... Yeah, can... I'm looking at the pictures, he's looking in uh, 20s. No, he's not, he's not in 20s. 20, 30s. Yeah, so right. He was about 36, 37 when he... Yeah. Was full, uh, balloon, balloon angioplasty. Now, what happens is that this is a young man who is... Uh, uh, you know, who, who studied in, in Dresden and, uh, and, and in Germany and uh, quickly became very interested. He, he was an inter he specialized in internal medicine and then did a bit of cardiology and radiology and was interested in the process of dottering, which I mentioned. You know, Charles' daughter was the first person to open up arteries. It wasn't called an angioplasty then. It was called dottering, just an opening up of arteries. And he became very interested in the process of opening up arteries or in the process of dottering. And uh, where he worked in, in Darmstadt, uh, in Germany, they wouldn't allow him to touch patients. They said, no, 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 you can't do any such thing in our hospital. You know, this is a respectable institution. We can't allow you to do that. So therefore, he moves to Zurich in Switzerland. And, uh, 
and there he, uh, along with a few colleagues, he uh, devises a balloon catheter made out of, you know, roughly semi-compliant and non-compliant material, which can actually lateralize plaque and open up plaque. And uh, this was done in the iliac artery and in the femoral artery. Uh, and uh, along with this man, Philip Meyer, who, who used to be his first assistant in most such procedures. And I'll show you uh, images of the, of the patent. Uh... Yeah, so this is, these are the balloon catheters that he invented. You know, these were used up um, extensively in the iliac segment. And it looks quite like what we use currently, you know, except for the steel hubs uh, and the clumsy large profile. Otherwise, it looks exactly like what we use. These are the different examples of the balloon catheters um, that he used. Now, and this is the patent. This is a true copy of the, the US patent that he subsequently submitted. Um, this, the first balloon angioplasty happened in 1974-75, I think, or 76. Uh, but the patent was finally accepted and published in 1980. So what happens is that usually when patents are submitted, they're, they're scrutinized until the time uh, they are under scrutiny, it's it's called patent pending. So you can't, nobody else can actually start copying that and, and, and manufacturing it. There's a process of patent pending, but uh, the actual patent was granted to him in 1980. And this is some of, this is the, this is the first successful case, intentional case of balloon angioplasty of the femoral artery performed by uh, Andreas Grunzik. Yeah, as you can see, it's 1974. This is when it happened, the first, uh, Balloon angioplasty. And what's very interesting is he calls it Dottering. Can you see this here? Can you see my cursor? It says Dottern in German. Okay, Nikhil, can you see this? Uh, yes, sir. So it it's had, written in German. Yeah. It's written in German and it still, I mean, in it, yeah. still says Dottern. But yeah. uh, do you see this something written in red above it? Yes, sir. That's actually uh, an addition made by his secretary, his office secretary. Yes, sir. He says, why don't we call it dilatation, dilatation? Okay, why are we still sticking to the word dotern, which is a 10 year old word, and you've invented a completely new device, a balloon catheter to open up this vessel. Because it is dilating the artery, why don't we call it dilatation? So this is the first time in the history of vascular interventions uh, that someone has used the word dilatation to opening up arteries. And this is actually a correction by an office secretary. That's how the word dilatation comes into our lexicon. For, uh, uh, for vascular interventions. And this is the first angiogram of a balloon angioplasty of the femoral artery. Now what happens is that uh, this person also is truly visionary. And I think uh, like Dr. Bedi and the other great people who have uh, who've started Endovascular Live and other uh, live surgical broadcasts, this is the first person in vascular surgery to actually start the live surgical broadcast, okay? This is in uh, in the late 1970s, okay? Now what happens is that before he starts these live surgical broadcasts, he uh, wants to try the same angioplasty procedures that he had done on the iliac and the femoral arteries in the coronaries, okay? Now again, nobody allows him to touch the coronaries because they say it's fine, you can open up the peripheral arteries, you know, if something goes wrong, you know, you can immediately open up the patient. Uh, drastically wrong, what's the worst that can happen? Uh, limb loss, uh, limb loss. And pain. Uh, but uh, heart patients, we won't allow you to touch because you know it's a matter of life and death. So even in Zurich, where he performs the first angioplasties, nobody allows him to, to you know, actually touch the, the coronaries. Finally, you know, he manages to persuade his seniors because as you can see, he's still in his 30s, about 38, 39, around that time. And uh, one of them says, all right, we'll allow you to perform an angioplasty. Unfortunately, the patient that was picked was very badly selected. Why? Because he had bilateral uh, iliacs occluded, so he couldn't, um, Gunzik couldn't do a femoral puncture. He had the right-sided subclavian occluded, so therefore he couldn't enter through the brachial. And he attempted puncturing the left brachial and somehow couldn't cannulate the left coronary artery because the, uh, the lesion was in the LAD. And therefore he couldn't, because couldn't cannulate the, uh, the left main, uh, he couldn't perform this procedure. And therefore, subsequent to that, nobody in Zurich allowed him to touch a patient. So this is again a great lesson to us about how 
you should pick the right kind of patients, particularly for your first few set of cases. So in Zurich, where he successfully performed his iliac and femoral angio balloon angioplasties, he couldn't perform a successful coronary angioplasty. He tried requesting some surgeons, some cardiac surgeons, look, why don't we anyway, you've taken the patient in the operating room, you've exposed the coronaries, let me now put in a guide wire and try and balloon dilate the coronaries. You can just close the arteriotomy remotely if it is successful. Uh, if it is successful, you've managed to avoid uh, the, uh, the bypass procedure. So cardiac surgeons in Zurich wouldn't allow him to do an intraoperative coronary angioplasty. So he then flies along with this man on the Vespa scooter, Philip Myers, to San Francisco. They managed to persuade in America, on the West Coast, all the way in San Francisco, some cardiac surgeon to allow them to do the first intraoperative coronary balloon angioplasty, okay, which is successful. Now, results of this success, armed when he's armed with the results, results of this success, people in Zurich allow him to then uh, perform coronary angioplasties. And then he starts his mentoring process. And this is the first live surgical broadcast of angioplasties being done. He comes back into the auditorium and uh, gives lectures to his, uh, to his audience. And this is an incredible photograph, Nikhil. Okay, this is one of the live surgical broadcasts. You can see that, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is, can you see the cursor? This is our friend Andreas Drunzik sitting here. But yes, this sir. one large photograph of an audience has so many illustrious people. This is Grunzik, first balloon angioplasty. This here is Charles' daughter, first angioplasty. Uh, this here is Melvin Jutkins. Melvin Jutkins was, has had assistant Charles' daughter in the first successful angioplasty and we all use the Jutkins catheter that was manufactured by Melvin Jutkins. And uh, on, in the fourth row, this man here is uh, Soans, Mason Soans, who performed the first coronary angiography. He was the first to cannulate the coronaries and perform the coronary ang angiography. So all these great people were in audience to listen to this 38, 39 year old man, Andreas Grunzik, uh, teach them how to perform balloon angioplasties. Incredible photograph. So, and again, uh, another, uh, interesting article and photographs from the archives. This is uh, incredible. This is the first successful intentional coronary balloon angioplasty performed by Andreas Grunzik in 1977. You can see this, September 14, 1977. High grade, almost 80% lesion, 80 to 85% in the LAD. Now, this is the angiogram of the same person, same patient performed in 2000. Okay, same patient. Angioplasty performed in 1977, not repeated, and the patient presented with recurrent chest pain, but you can see that this patient had a stenotic lesion in some other artery, but the LAD, which was opened up by Andreas Grunzik in 1977, continues to be open in the year 2000. Incredible photograph, an incredible uh, archival image. Which brings us now to questions of compliance. This is, I think, uh, a suitable sort of historical introduction as we move into understanding the very basics of balloons and stents and other things. And to understand the, the, the concept of something called as compliance of balloons. Okay. Now, can anyone, uh, particularly the postgraduates, explain the term compliance? What is meant by compliance? Is anyone there? Yes, sir. Yeah. Can anyone dis uh, define what compliance is? Okay. Uh, let's, yeah. let's do this please, please, uh, please explain. Okay. So balloon compliance means change in the balloon diameter as a function of inflation pressure. Okay. What that means is, let's say, if there is a balloon that you've managed to inflate to what is known as the specified uh, diameter at a specified pressure. Okay. So let's say at 20 atmospheres, you've managed to inflate a balloon to 10 millimeters. Okay. Subsequently, if you inflate the balloon more, if there isn't any extrinsic pressure on the balloon, the balloon is likely to expand more because the material comprising the balloon thins out further. 
okay that is called compliance the balloon is compliant it allows itself either to be compressed or to be expanded based on the pressure okay if a balloon is non compliant it means that the material that is used to manufacture the balloon is so tough that even if you were to increase the pressure the balloon would rather rupture but it would not expand in diameter okay that is what is meant by compliance and as i introduce the term compliance i'm also going to introduce some other terms here you can see balloon diameter is the nominal inflated balloon diameter measured at a specified pressure okay what is nominal nominal means that you know at the specified pressure if the balloon is meant to in, to be inflated at 5 mm 6 mm 7 mm whatever the nominal diameter is meant to be uh that is called the diameter of the balloon the length of the balloon refers to the length of the straight body it does not include the shoulders okay and the tip so whenever you measure the length of a balloon as you're asking your lab technician to hand out uh, sizes and lengths of balloons from the inventory you have to concentrate on the working length which is the length of the straight part of the body what is the burst pressure the burst pressure is divided into three the first is called uh the the of or a pressure of the balloon is divided into three the first is called the nominal pressure which means the pressure that is used to inflate the balloon to its designated diameter balloon of millimeters in the upper hi lage hote nahi wo ye log to word mein rakhte kahan pe wo bhi pata nahi chal raha na mujhe dekhiye look i think your mouth is on cross talk dekhta hu kahin so um so so the balloon that is used to inflate uh, the the pressure that is used to inflate the balloon at its designated diameter is called the nominal pressure the rated burst pressure means that the the confidence with which you can say that if you inflate the balloon to a designated pressure only 1 out of 100 balloons or less than 1 out of 100 balloons will rupture okay that is the rate, rated burst pressure or in other words 99% of the balloons will not rupture at that designated pressure that is called the rated burst pressure there is also something called as the mean burst pressure which means the pressure at which only 50% of the balloons are likely to not rupture that's called the mean burst pressure okay and compliance as i'd explain is the if there's any change in the balloon diameter as you keep increasing your pressure i hope these concepts are clear to everybody okay and as i mentioned that the fundamental thing governing compliance of the balloon is the substance which is used to manufacture these balloons and you can see that you know these are the various substances um, that are uh, are used so the more of nylon or polyurethane there is in a balloon uh, material the more compliant it's likely to be the more pet there is in a balloon the less compliant or the more non compliant it's likely to be okay um these you can see are some ex examples of completely compliant balloons okay uh, these compliant balloons are uh, are balloons which are used this is ex for example a kota balloon which is a balloon that is used uh, to fix and mold uh, certain stent grafts uh, because it can it can sculpt the the stent graft once it is placed within a, a vessel because it can mold uh the dimensions of the stent graft because of the compliance of the material that constitutes it if you were to hold such a balloon in your hand and press you will be able to press it okay if you are holding a non compliant balloon in your hand you try and press it it will feel like a piece of stone or uh, you know cement or rock it will you will not be able to compress a non compliant balloon when you try and hold it between your fingers This is another example of compliant balloons. These are the embolectomy catheters. Uh, they will not deform uh, the artery in which they are inflated, which is why they do not cause any damage. Because what you do is you pass this. Uh, the white one is an over-the-wire balloon embolectomy catheter. This is the uh, the standard balloon embolectomy catheter. As you will, as all of us have done, you know, we 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 pass the balloon embolectomy catheter through thrombus and then inflate it and then drag uh, the thrombus out. even if we were to inflate it beyond a certain uh, uh with a certain excess volume or with a certain excess pressure what is going to happen is that it's not going to damage the artery because the uh the arterial wall is going to compress 
the balloon, it will not be damaged by the inflation of the balloon. Okay, so uh, this is a comparison between what happens when you use a semi-compliant angioplasty balloon catheter and a non-compliant angioplasty balloon catheter. So as you will notice that uh, this semi-compliant angioplasty catheter will allow some amount of expansion of the material of the balloon um, catheter. The non-compliant angioplasty catheter, the material that is used to manufacture it, it does not allow any expansion beyond the designated diameter. Okay, A semi-compliant will allow some expansion. So as you can see that this is where the plaque is. This is where the stenosis is. And because the plaque is actually holding, it's stronger than the material of the balloon, it is holding and constricting uh, the balloon in the middle. And this part is not allowed to uh, expand. As you keep on increasing the pressure in the balloon, the other parts of the balloon will expand. Okay, A non-compliant angioplasty balloon will never allow that. And because the other parts, this is like a dog boning uh, effect that you notice. And because the other parts are dilating more, Okay, and this uses material that's much harder and firmer than a non-compliant, uh, than sorry, a compliant balloon. You will cause stress and damage to these parts of the artery. Okay, so the chance of actually damaging the normal parts of the artery on the edge of the stenosis are much higher when you pick a semi-compliant angioplasty balloon than when you pick a non-compliant uh, angioplasty balloon. Okay, so as I said that uh, because of distortion, because of balloon distortion outside the area of stenosis, semi-compliant balloons are prone to overstretching in areas of less plaque and normal arteries as compared to non-compliant balloons. How do you, how do you evaluate the, the trauma and the stress caused to the arterial wall? You do uh, use a kind of simulation technology which is called finite element analysis. And this is what it looks like. This is a non-compliant balloon. Can you see this? Even though the absolute pressure that is used uh, to dilate this balloon is much higher, 27 atmosphere. You can see that green is less stress, okay? Blue is absolutely zero stress, but this is the plaque. This is the finite element analysis simulation. This is the plaque, and these are the normal parts of the artery. You can see that there is practically very little stress in the normal parts of the artery, it says green. But you see when you use a semi-compliant balloon, and this is the plaque, a focal area of narrowing, because of overstretching in this area, because of the use of uh, uh, these, uh, uh, this material, you will find that uh, the, uh, the, the pressure and the, uh, the stress on the normal parts of the artery surrounding the plaque are much, much higher. So you have to be careful, particularly with very tight uh, calcific areas of stenosis, not to use compliant balloons because you'll end up causing dissections edge dissections. So, so this is again a similar kind of thing. You'll see that wasting is typical here. And you can see that the, there is over distension in the areas around the stenosis. This is a non-compliant balloon. You can see that there's uniform dilatation because the, the fabric or the substance that is used to manufacture doesn't allow overstretching beyond a certain diameter. But this one does. And you can see that there's much more damage in the neighboring uh, parts of the normal artery. And that is how you can get edge dissection. So you have to be very careful about which balloons to pick for which kind of lesion. So some of the examples of the, the non-compliant, and, and remember that you know these are very strong words, non-compliant and semi-compliant. This, this exists on a spectrum. You don't have absolutely non-compliant balloons and absolutely semi-compliant balloons, but uh, most of the the high pressure balloons that we get are very close to non-compliance. So for example, you've got the Mustang uh, by, uh, by Boston Scientific, or you've got the Conquest by uh, uh, Bard or uh, the Atlas Gold. These are examples of non-compliant uh, balloons. And if you use it in the wrong kind of place, semi-compliant balloons are more likely to cause edge dis dissections than uh, non-compliant balloons. Okay, and therefore, when you pick up a balloon catheter, you must look at something like this. This is called a compliance chart. Okay, and this is typically the compliance chart of a semi compliant balloon. Um, this is, I think, the Armada or something like that. Uh, so you can see that um, this is, the, this is the, the nominal pressure. Okay, so let's say there's a two millimeter balloon that you're using. Sorry. Uh, so in the two millimeter balloon, at nominal pressure, you are. Um, 
achieving a diameter and expansion of roughly the same, two millimeters. But as you increase it to the RPP, the rated burst pressure, the diameter is capable of enlarging. The material is capable of stretching out and over, um, and over dilating to 2.15 millimeters. If you, this is the rated burst pressure, remember, only one out of 100 balloons will rupture, or 0.1 out of 100 balloons will rupture at this pressure. You can keep going up and up and up till you reach the mean burst pressure, where 50% of the balloons are likely to rupture. And when you go up to a, a pressure of 22 atmosphere, you'll find that the same balloon is capable of going up to a diameter of 2.23. So I think you'll all be well advised to take a look at the compliance chart uh, that accompanies every balloon catheter when you ask your technician to pull out a balloon. The, 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 the next thing that you need to be concerned about is something called as the tapering zone, okay? Uh, the tapering zone is, is what constitutes the shoulder of the balloon. You will find that um, the narrower the angle on the tapering zone, uh, you are likely to get a lower profile of the balloon. And also it increases the trackability, the pushability, and the flexibility of the balloon, um, you know, because uh, it's, it's, it becomes a more kind of aerodynamic or more dynamic and fluid uh, passage over a wire. And therefore you get much better transmission of uh, forces of uh, vector forces on a guide wire if you have a narrow transition zone with a low uh, angle, as opposed to um, a transition zone which is short and abrupt. So this is classically what would be labeled as short sh shoulders of the balloon. And this will prevent edge effects, okay? Because the longer the shoulder, the more edge effects you're likely to get. But uh, this will prevent edge effects, but it adversely affects the trackability and the pushability and the flexibility of the balloon. So this is a trade-off that you'll have to achieve based on the kind of lesion that you're dealing with. And then again, the transition zone and the material of the uh, balloon will determine how flexible the balloon is. Flexibility and trackability are closely linked. You know, if you're, if you're having to expand uh, a balloon in this angle at a bifurcation, at a branch and so on. And also this is uh, a tight focal stenosis and if there is over dilatation, over stretching seen on account of semi-compliant balloons in the other parts of the balloon because of displacement of fluid. Uh, the other idea that you must uh, be familiar with is of course the distinction between the over the wire balloon uh, and the, the single operator uh, balloon, uh, also known as the monorail uh, balloon. What happens is that, uh, as you can see, that you need an exchange length wire because the wire has to completely go through uh, the shaft and then exit. And in a monorail system, it, you have to be quite close uh, to the balloon in the shaft, which is where the, the wire can enter and exit. And therefore, the length of the wire that is required for monorail balloons uh, is much shorter. You can have a, a short length, 190 centimeter um, wire for uh, for a single operator balloon and um, uh, an exchange length for the over the wire balloon. Obviously what happens is that uh, you need uh, at least an assistant when you're using uh, exchange length uh, systems. Uh, and this you can theoretically uh, do entirely on your own, but what also is affected when you use a monorail system, what is gained in, uh, in uh, in avoiding an assistant is lost in trackability and pushability because the wire is not tracking, is not passing through the entire length of the shaft. You do have a loss of trackability and pushability when you're using a monorail or a single operator system. Just a word about scoring balloons. Um, scoring balloons are used typically for neoentomal hyperplasia. They're balloons that have these scoring blades a fix on the on the balloon, and uh -huh. uh, when you dilate these balloons, what happens is that will now the inevitable hypothesis to be scored, sliced, aquatic ring that is produced. Uh, as a result of these stenosis, this is a typical kind of stenosis. Usually we're talking about anastomotic stenosis or in fistulas where you've got neoentomal hyperplasia, which will recoil in response to a normal, even a high pressure balloon because of the 
the rubbery nature of these fibrotic rings. Uh, it is not plaque, it is not atherosclerotic plaque, which is differently constituted and which can be lateralized by uh, our uh, semi-compliant and non-compliant balloons. But here you're dealing with a different kind of stenosis. You're dealing with a kind of fibrotic stricture or cicatrization or a rubbery kind of material, which needs to be scored, which needs to be incised to break the, uh, the, the fibrotic ring and therefore, uh, you know, um, cause dilatation. You, a similar example would, would be for general surgeons when they use the technique of lateral sphincterotomy for uh, uh, fissure in anal. You know, what happens is that you have to break the sphincter uh, to cause relaxation. Similarly, in this case, you have to break the fibrotic ring in order to uh, uh, open up the stenotic area. So uh, now we're going to come to stents uh, and I'm going to uh, demonstrate something to you. If uh, uh, I'm stopping my screen sharing and uh, I'm just going to show you the various kinds of stents that are, uh, are used. Can you, uh, can you see what I'm showing you? Is this clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. It's clear, sir. Yes. So this is a, a nitinol, uh, a, a tube. Okay. Now, if you were to laser cut this very finely, you know, by a pre-programmed large uh, industrial laser cutter, which works with great precision, you will arrive at this. This is a stent. Can you see this again? Yes. Yes, sir. This is a nitinol stent, which is arrived by lifting this nitinol tube. Now, as you will notice, that because the stent is manufactured, the so nitinol is a nickel, um, you know, titanium alloy, which has great, uh, which has the great property of elastic deformation. Okay, so because this is manufactured in the uh, in this diameter, in this position, from a nitinol tube, which is laser cut, it retains the memory of that size. Okay, so even if you were to crimp it, if I were to press it, okay, I'm crimping it right now, it regains its original shape and size. This is called elastic deformation, deformation or hyperelastic deformation. This is what allows it tremendous flexibility, tremendous resilience. You can see that I'm able to bend this completely without affecting it. I'm able to tie this in a knot without completely, uh, without affecting it in any way. Okay. And uh, this uh, is called uh, el elastic deformation or hyperelastic deformation. Now, what happens is that the manner in which this is introduced into the body is that you crimp it, you suppress it, and load it onto a catheter. Okay, so imagine if this there is a stent inside this catheter. Okay, all right, you've crimped it, and you've managed to convey it to the area of the stenosis. It's now. Hold on, let me just. So you've managed to convey it to the area of stenosis, okay? And then you hold this. And if you are to pull back the restraining catheter, the sheath that is keeping it restrained, you will see that the stent will open in the vessel, okay? So what happens is that this is manufactured in the open position. It retains the memory of that open position. You crimp it artificially, but even when you crimp it, when you release the uh, compressive force or the restraining uh, force, this will open up. And because the direction of opening up the stent, this is a self-expanding stent, okay? The direction, the vector that you use to open up the stent is coaxial with the, the longitudinal axis of the blood vessel. It's possible that when you are moving the restraining catheter back or the sheath back, the stent might jump in the opposite direction because the force, the vector is in this direction, okay? So therefore, when you are deploying a 
self-expanding stent, it's entirely possible that the, uh, the stent might jump slightly. So this is not for precise deployment, okay? Uh, particularly in the ostium and other things. As opposed to this, unfortunately, I'm not carrying a, a balloon expandable stent because all the offices are, are closed and we weren't getting uh, material which had expired. So a balloon expandable stent is a stainless steel stent. Okay, and nowadays they're using this special kind of alloy called Elgiloy, uh, which is again made up of, um, you know, co cobalt and chromium and, you know, uh, some amount of iron and, and molybdenum and all of that. The great uh, features of the balloon expandable stent is that it is manufactured in the crimped position, okay, and loaded onto an appropriately sized balloon. It is manufactured in the crimped position, okay. It is... The stainless steel, uh, sorry, the, the self-expanding stent is manufactured in the open position by laser cutting a tube. The balloon expandable stent is manufactured in the crimped position and loaded onto a balloon, and that's how it's supplied to us. When you open up the balloon, the crimped stent will open to a new diameter, okay? Now that diameter might be different based on the size of the balloon you use because of the nature of Elgiloy or because of the nature of stainless steel, it can expand beyond a certain designated diameter because you don't know what that diameter is. It's not manufactured at that diameter. And in case it increases beyond that diameter, there is some foreshortening. So what you, what you gain in diameter, you lose in the length of the stent, okay? And uh, that is called foreshortening. And this uh, balloon expandable stent can be crimped back, okay? So it doesn't have this elastic deformation property. It has some a property which is known as plastic deformation, which means that if you press it, it will remain crimped. It will be deformed in the direction of application of pressure or force. So because it is easy to crimp it, you cannot use it in areas where there is excessive movement or excessive uh, multiple forces are uh, exerted on the area. So for instance, the superficial femoral artery, which is an artery which is uh, subjected to all kinds of forces and pressure, you cannot use a balloon expandable stent in such areas. It's best to use it when you're in, when you require precise placement, because as I had explained to you, if this is the, this is the balloon, uh, this is the balloon on which the stent is crimped, the vector is upward and downward in all radial directions. So the stent will open up like this. It will open up exactly where the balloon is inflated. There's no question of jumping because the direction of the vector is not coaxial with the longitudinal axis of the blood vessel. It will open up exactly where the balloon is inflated. Okay. Now, that's why for precise placement, you use balloon expandable stents. Uh, also, the other thing to be remembered is that if you are to, unfortunately, I don't have a um, a balloon expandable stent, but just to show you, if this is a self-expanding stent and this is a balloon expandable stent, if you are to apply the same pressure to both, okay, which is not deforming pressure, it's not where you get plastic deformation, but the same kind of uniform pressure, you will find that it is easy to compress the self-expanding stent, but at the same pressure, you will not be able to compress the balloon expandable stent, uh, stent. Therefore, the radial strength of the balloon expandable stent, because it's made up of stainless steel or elgiloy or other strong, stronger metals and alloys, the radial strength is much, much higher than the radial strength in a, a self-expanding stent. Therefore, you would use it where excess calcium or osteal lesions, where there's the plug burden is quite high, where precise placement is required. But because the material is much stiffer and much harder, the, the flexibility of the stent and the, you know, the tracking characteristics and the pushability of the stent is affected. Uh, what is gained in radial strength is lost in pushability and trackability and other things. I think we've already exceeded our time uh, in this presentation. There's a lot more to talk about, covered stents, um, drug eluting stents, and um, you know, um, other such technology, uh, drug coated balloons. But uh, I think that would be a topic for discussion on a completely um, separate day, because that's again, uh, an exhaustive presentation. But I hope I've managed to get the, the very basics. So just before I close, I just want to show you this stent. 
Uh, this is slightly different. This is uh, the supera. This is a vasculum mimetic stent. And if you will notice closely, this is a bunch of nitinol wires which have been woven together. This is not a stent like this. Okay, look at the difference between the two. This is a laser cut tube. Think of this as about three or four or five nitinol wires which have been braided, woven together in this fashion. This is, to my knowledge, the strongest stent available. You can pull it, you can try and break it. We are not here in, uh, you know, uh, physically present in front of each other, but when I normally do this presentation in, uh, in Evolve and in EVL, I hand this over to most respondents and try and, and challenge them to actually break the stent. You cannot break the stent. This stent cannot be fractured. It's extremely strong, okay? And uh, therefore, what is interesting is that if you are to place this in an area of high uh, pressure, and where the, the multiple kinds of pressures and forces exerted onto the blood vessel, elongation, torque, compression, there is a chance that self-expanding stents might fracture, okay? But as you can see that if you were to pull this, the stent is fractured, you know, okay? This will not resist, this will not resist the movement of the vessel into which it has been introduced. It will actually mimic the movement of the vessel into which it's Put, you know, so femoral popliteal segment in runners and people who are constantly bending requires a great deal of adjustment of the stent. You know, all kinds of movements are taking place. This is compression, this is expansion. So it allows all these movements to happen. It does not resist it. And because it is allowing these movements, it's mimicking the movements of the vessel. This is called a vasculomimetic stent. Exceedingly good idea to put this in the femoral popliteal region. So with that, I'll end um, this very basic presentation. I'm happy to take questions if uh, anyone uh, has any questions. Sarvik, Thank very you. excellent presentation and you have such a good stamina. I don't know from where you get that very stamina. And uh, very well uh, researched and uh, very well read uh, that topic. And Thank you. Consolation. And uh, uh, yes, house is open. And that was a very nice presentation, sir. All points well covered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, Satvik, a little query: Why the balloon-mounted stand? They come in that very fixed uh, length. Why? Why they don't make in the longer length? The balloon is not being manufactured in longer lengths because if you, the capability will be affected. You know, if you're going, it's entirely possible that uh, because that comes only the maximum size, 39 or 59. Everything you also have to take the stent has to reach this because of the thickness trackability is a little difficult task. Okay. Sir, thank you for this wonderful presentation, Nikhil here. Yeah. Dr. Girijanandan is asking what is the difference between vein, uh, vein stent and uh, arterial stent? Yes, very good question. Yeah, so, so again, as I mentioned that um, what you need to do in an artery is uh, quite different from what you need to do in, uh, in a vein. In a vein, the nature of the lesion is fibrotic, it's cicatrization, it is uh, chronic thrombotic, uh, which produces a rubbery lesion. So obviously this is the kind of stent that you will require uh, we have to have much, much higher uh, radial strength than uh, the uh, ones required in an artery. Because in an artery, you need to lateralize plaque. But in, um, in, in a vein, you need something completely different. You need tremendous radial strength. Um, and therefore, again, you're going to pass through uh, areas which are going to be cicatrized badly. Uh, it's, it's not entirely possible. And these are much longer lesions we're dealing with. Even to get uh, to cross the sometimes might involve the crossing of the entire length of the, uh, the femoral and the iliac to reach the IVC. So you require excellent trackability, pushability, flexibility. So it's a different kind of material that is required. And uh, so, um, and therefore, uh, you need much stronger strength um, as, a, as a very fundamental uh, proof of concept. You require much stronger material and much stronger strength, radial strength to, to be used in the venous system. So, but um, to my mind, uh, one of the cheapest stents which works wonderfully well in the venous system is the wall stent, which used to be a stainless steel uh, Elgiloy stent actually, 
because stainless steel will have to be a balloon uh, expandable stent. You require a self-expanding stent for that flexibility and um, flexibility. So uh, the wall stent used to be an excellent stent and it's quite cheap. Uh, and uh, the trouble with this is that because you're using material which can uh, foreshorten or forelengthen, there's, it's very difficult to achieve control over uh, the, the final length of the balloon after deployment, uh, final length of the stent after deployment. So it's entirely possible that if you're dealing with an 8 mm lesion, uh, it, because of the various rings of constriction and because of restrained opening of the stent, the 8 mm could fall lengthen into a, a 10, uh, sorry, could fall lengthen into like a 10 centimeter lesion, which might completely uh, cause um, a catastrophic outcome. You know, so you have to be very careful about the material, the kind of stent, uh, if there is any foreshortening or for lengthening that is expected when you're using it, particularly in venous anatomy. And also MRI compatibility, because, you know, uh, you are, particularly when you are uh, incorporating stents uh, nowadays and in the abdominal area, you have to be sure that you are uh, not using stents that would have any amount of iron in them, you know. So non-ferromagnetic stents are very important. Elgiloy, uh, the venous stent uh, that is used uh, has some amount of iron and therefore might not be entirely MRI compatible. But the newer venous stents, which are nitinol stents, are uh, completely safe in, uh, in the body when an MRI is considered. Nikhil, what is the case now which we are taking in the lab? So, thank you. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, Okay, Hi, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, thank you. Nice here, sir. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, so sir, we uh, have a perma cath patient sir. which will get admitted. Uh, uh, can you, uh, Satrik, sir? So yeah. after that we'll take that. Yeah. Can you tell us about the cell structure of the stent? Sir, what is the significance of the cell structure in a stent? Yeah. Open cell to cell and closed cell. So, so basically, you know, um, the if I can show you, I, it would have been better if I had. Uh, images or something like that you know, because it's difficult to explain it verbally. Uh, if you want, we can do a separate presentation on, on yes. those. So if you can see that this is, uh, this is, can you see this? This is an open celled stent. Can you see this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can see. I, what I'll do is I will, we can do a repeat presentation when I'll get images yes, and films and how it is important and what is protrusion yes, cells of the stent, you know? <laughs> yes. Communicate it till you see it as a as an image or a video or something like that. You know? Okay, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Okay, so that's it. I think we have a Pamakath patient. He'll get admitted, so it will take some time. So whenever we start that case, we'll uh, intimate you. Right. Thank okay, you, Ganesh. Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. You.